Good morning. I want to just kind of go ahead and talk while they're receiving the offering. Uh, just one quick announcement is that uh, you'll notice th this is a huge year for our country, all the elections that are taking place. And so we, we've, uh, uh, we have an opportunity. Some of you are not registered to vote is where I'm going on this. So we have an opportunity for you to register to vote. Now, if you haven't registered, many of you have moved in and you have a driver's license, but that doesn't mean you're registered to vote. And uh, we as Christ followers want to uh, take our opportunity to vote so that you can go out there. If you register today, if you're not registered, you cannot vote in the March uh, elections, but you can in the May and then definitely in the fall when we, uh, when we have the presidential elections and, and this kind of thing. So we're giving you that opportunity. There's two places right out there and then right in the foyer down the hallway a little bit. And I, I, let me say one other thing just uh, as we're settling in. You know, things happen during the course of a week. You know, we, some of you we only see on the weekend. Uh, some of you may be here on, on uh, uh, midweek for other activities. But things happen. Uh, just, just the case of this past week, David Littlestar, uh, his dad, uh, passed away, so he had to go deal with his dad. Un unexpectedly, that happened. And then we had two babies born, the uh, Caracas family and, and uh, Cliff and Laura Kant. The reason I'm pointing over here, Cliff was just playing the guitar, and uh, it was his opportunity to get out of the house. And so uh, <laughs> he was saying, don't we have about four other services to do? But uh, Laura's back here, and you got the little one, Daniel. That strong name, right? Uh, Daniel. Dan? Daniel. I know, you're, but you go by Dan. You're a strong man, Dan. Oh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. If, if you're new to Central, we started this decade with a series called Fresh Start, and we just believe that there are certain times as followers of Jesus that we just need fresh starts, and we talked about fresh start in the Word, fresh start with prayer, fresh start in community, and a fresh start in evangelism last week, and a fresh start today in serving. And so we're going to be in John chapter 13 in just a moment. Let me give you a, a, a picture to get you started, though. Bud Wilkinson, the legendary University of Oklahoma coach that retired many years ago and, and has passed away now, but uh, he coached at the University of Oklahoma, and then like many, he went into broadcasting, so he would do college football games on the weekends. And so they asked Bud Wilkinson one time if he would define what a football game is. And he said this, he said, a football game is 22 people on the field desperately in need of rest and 65,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> and he described the football game that way. And, uh, you know, it, it has been said, I read an article on this actually, that in a arena of a football game or whatever, the, the people that are most apt to be unhealthy uh, from, from things are not those playing the game who may get hurt in the contact of the game, but it's the people in the stands because of their stresses and the cardio stuff that happens, cardiovascular struggles they have, heart conditions, the other things that happen, probably what they eat in the stands, drink in the stands, I don't know. But the, but the people in the stands are the one who are more apt to be unhealthy than those that are playing the game. And when I think of that in a spiritual sense, you see, God did not create us to be spectators, but to be a part of the game, the part of life, the processes of life. And uh, I want us to look at this today, and we're in John chapter 13. Please understand uh, that if you're new to the Bible, John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he is writing this from his viewpoint. And when we get to chapter 13 in his, in his book, John, we're talking about the end of Jesus' earthly life. So everything he does is of utmost importance. If, if you had just a day to live or a week to live, what you're going to get across is of utmost importance. So 
John chapter 13, verse 1, and I'm going to read, bear with me, we're going to read through verse 17, but let's get the whole uh, picture of what is taking place. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I, w- I want to just for a few moments today, I, I just want to unpack this, and I want to see how God is calling us to have a fresh start when it comes to serving. And I'm going to just give you some thoughts as we go through this passage of Scripture. But the first one is this. Jesus knew why he came. Now, that may sound a strange place, but Jesus, in verse 13, it was just before the Passover meal, and Jesus knew the hour had come. You see, Jesus was born to die. You know, we say most kids are born, all these children, they got so much of life ahead of them, right? That's what we say. Jesus was born, and we're in his earthly limitation as a man. He came to realize that his death was going to be on a cross. I don't completely know, but he knew that the hour was coming for him to lay down his life for all of mankind. You see, he knew his identity. His identity was with the Father in heaven. And what happened is, is we see throughout his life, and we talked about this, out of his identity, he had intimacy with the Father, and that led to this expression of washing their feet. You see, this washing of of their feet was just a picture of what he had already done on a much huge, grander scale. He, He emptied himself, it says in Paul's writings, Paul being a follower of Jesus, it says he emptied himself of all of the heavenly glory And he became just like us in these earth suits. And it was just like him taking off that outer garment and putting on a servant's towel and washing his disciples' feet. You see, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 20, he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus knew his identity, and out of that identity came this expression of love to his disciples. Now, What does that mean to you and me? I think think we struggle with our identity today. You you put a bunch of men in a room. They don't know each other very well. They will kind of awkwardly talk, and then this will be the question. What do you do? You You see, we equate our identity with what we do. So if you are an insurance salesman or, or uh, you're a high-tech guy or, or whatever you may be, or coach, a teacher, you, this is what you say. I, this is what I do, and we get our identity from what we do. 
Jesus got his identity from the Father. And if we can see ourselves as sons and daughters of the King, if we could see our identity right there, we will know that what we do comes from our identity and we don't just do to be. And so this is what we need to understand. And Jesus knew his identity. And so even knowing his identity, there should have been a paid servant or a slave to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus knew his identity, and he, as an expression of service to those closest to him, he was able to do that. So often we struggle with our identity. But I really believe if we could understand that we get our identity from the Father and we, we strive to have intimacy with him, then our lives would become an expression of that. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. This is a little longer, but, but I'll explain it. Hanging around a Jesus environment doesn't make you a follower. Hanging around a Jesus environment doesn't make you a follower. It, it, it's said before that being in a church no long, no, has no more uh, guarantee that you're a Christian than being in a garage makes you a car. That, that, that what, what I'm saying is, is that we look at one of the 12, Judas Iscariot, and Judas, for three years, had walked closely with Jesus, but he wasn't a follower of Jesus. I think we suffer in our country today because we've, we've somehow bought into an easy believism of works that if I go to church, then I earn God's favor, then he is obligated to take me. And it's not that way at all. And so just hanging out in this room does not make you a follower of Jesus. And just as Judas, who hung out with Jesus all of this time, I I just wonder, uh, and and many people will say, well, that was the sovereign will of God. He had to fulfill that and, and this kind of stuff. But I just wonder what he saw. He saw the miracles. He saw the love of Christ poured out. He saw all of these things, but yet he still walked into betray. Maybe he was calling Jesus's hand. We we, we just know that he betrayed Jesus. And uh, I heard one writer say this. He said, in the garden, Judas is the one that went up and kissed the door of heaven and walked away and went to hell. And, and so we're talking that sometimes we can hang around a Jesus environment and not know him and not even be close to him. Thirdly, the, the scripture teaches us this, that the garment for a follower of Jesus is a towel. The garment of the follower of Jesus is a towel. Jesus, what he did was, is he took a bowl, he took off his outer garment, and he took a towel, and he wrapped it around his waist, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, we're thinking, ah, is it that big a deal? It was a huge deal. You see, there should have been a servant or a slave who would have washed everybody's feet when they came in. That would have been his role. It was a menial task. It wasn't something that, that, uh, that anybody was supposed to do. It was for the lowest of the low to come and wash feet. And, and they were, you got to understand the culture of the day. They wore sandals. They, they, it was hot, dusty, and, and animals were on the road. And who knows what it was on your feet? And here they are. Uh, they should have had a servant who took a towel and a bowl and were washing each of their feet. For some reason, there was not anyone there. And so Jesus took it upon himself, took off the outer garment, wrapped the towel around his waist, knelt at each of them, including Judas, and washed their feet. Listen, the tools of a follower of Jesus are going to be the same tools he used which I believe are a towel and a basin. Yeah, I believe in the full armor of God, but it's amazing what we let the world know we're followers of Jesus is by the way we serve. I, uh, anytime I'm part of an ordination or of a licensing of a minister, somebody going into the ministry, the gift I give them is a basin and a towel. And I tell our staff all the time, listen guys, we are to be the chief feet washers in this church. We ought to be the ones. We surrender our rights. We are willing to do whatever we can to serve in the name of the Lord, to serve you, 
to serve others. And I tell him this, and we, we try to model it, and we try to live it out. But this is the tools. It's amazing how arrogant Christians can be, that uh, we became very brash, and we almost become mean, and mean-spirited, and we say things, and we, we say them with anger, and we say them with condemnation. And I wonder if we took the tools of a towel and a basin more than we took our high horse to see the impact we would make on this world. But that is what Jesus taught us, is to take the towel and to take the basin. Next point is this. Daily cleansing is needed. And here's what I mean by that. Daily cleansing is needing. Notice he came to Simon Peter. Simon, brash Simon Peter. Always type A. Always would speak and then think. You ever know anybody like that? Sure. Don't elbow them. Uh, but, but Jesus comes to Simon Peter and he's going to wash his feet. You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then here we go. Do you, do you ever know people like this, personalities? They're either way up here or they, they are extremists. They're just extremists. Peter was an extremist. He says, well, then wash all of me. Give me a bath. You know, not just my feet. Just do all of me. And in, in other words, I'm, here I am, Jesus. I'm in for the whole thing. Only he's going to be denying Christ in just a few hours. And so here, here they are. And... Uh, and so Jesus says, no, anybody that's had a bath only needs to have his feet washed. And, and that sounds pretty, pretty uh, commonsensical. But here's what it's referring to. You see, when you come to Christ, wh whatever that may have been, you made a face step towards Christ. You realized you were a sinner. You repented. And you come to Christ and say, Lord, I commit my life to you. I, my desire to follow after you. And what the Lord does at that point is there is a cleansing. We call it justification, just as if you hadn't sinned. There's a justification that comes. And we have baptism as a, as a symbolic gesture of the washing away of that sin. And you're justified, just as if you had never sinned. You have union with Christ. However, if you're like me, which most of you are in this room, you stumble on a daily basis. You, you wish you could do the right thing. And listen... I may act good on the outside, but sometimes my motive of my heart is just terrible. It stinks. And so the Lord knows the motive, and so it, it, it's just like that. And so what I need is I need daily, I need daily feet washing, so to speak, so that my communion is restored. So there is union with Christ that's justification, and there's communion that sometimes gets messed up, but we come and repent, and we this is what a biblical term or, or a theological term we call sanctification. It's growing in your grace with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So we need daily washings. And, and what Jesus did with Peter, you no longer need, you don't need a bath. You've been washed. You no longer need to be saved again. You no longer need, you don't need to be baptized again. What you need is you need to repent so that your communion is restored. Does that make sense? And we need that on a daily basis. One, one more thing that I want to make out of this passage, as we get to the end, and, and, and this is the point, we are called to follow the pattern of Jesus. We are called to follow the pattern of Jesus. In verse 15, Jesus says this, I have set you an example and the word example in the Greek, it's a great word. It actually refers to pattern. Okay, my, my grandmother used to sew a lot, make her clothes, okay? And I remember that. And, and she would take those patterns you get from JCPenney and the little folder, and you know what I'm talking about for you that back in the day. And uh, some of you may still use them now. And so she would take the fabric, spread it out, and she would take the pins, and she would pin that pattern onto the fabric, and then she'd take her trusty scissors and start cutting out the, the dress or, or whatever, shirt, blouse, whatever she was doing, and she would cut the pattern. And that's the picture here, is that Jesus has set a pattern that you and I are to follow. What was that pattern? It was taking the bowl and the towel, and it was washing one another's feet. 
Well, is that literal? Well, it could be, but literally, you know, it's serving others, putting them ahead of you, putting their needs ahead of yours so that you're serving and taking care of them just like Jesus did. You see, this is what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. It is a radical, right? I mean, nothing else teaches this in the world. We are taught to be number one. We're taught to be push ourselves to the top of the pile. And here Jesus is stooping as low as he can to wash the feet of his disciples. You know, as I look at this, I think there's different places that we need to serve. I think service ought to begin, number one, at home. See, the home is the community, which is the training ground for how we live it out in the world. Serving ought to begin at home. When I do a wedding, and I know Al does this too, and, and Brett, we, we like Ephesians chapter 5, because it says, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's, it's profound, it's deep, it's a beautiful picture of marriage. But sometimes we start with that, wives submit to your husbands. But the, actually, you go back to verse 20 in Ephesians 5, and it says this, you ready? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Be willing to surrender your rights for one another. In fact, the marriage relationship ought to be the place where you see service lived out like no other place. And then it's translated into the home. A father gives the example, the mother gives an example, gives a pattern, and the children follow in that. But let's be honest, serving in the home is the hardest place. I mean, how many of you have ever had somebody come up to you? You got kids, and they said, man, your kids are great. They, uh, man, they, they served, and they cared, and you're thinking, whose kids are these? They won't make their bed. They won't take out the garbage. They won't do nothing around the house. And they'll do it for you. We've all heard that before. Because it's easier to put the show on with somebody else than to be sincere at home. We are called to begin serving with those that we love the most, which is our home. And that service is surrendering your rights to put others ahead of yourself. I think dads should model it number one. And then we go from there. So we serve in the home. Number two, I think we're called to serve in the church. Because Paul wrote in his letter to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, he's talking about these spiritual gifts that we've been given, not to be a show-off, but to minister within the body of Christ. We are called to serve within the body. Um, and sometimes, this is, what, this is what happens. You ready? Sometimes we, especially the introverts, back up and let the extroverts do everything. But sometimes we think, oh, somebody else will teach the kids. Somebody else will, will sing in the worship team. Somebody else will work the parking lot. Somebody else will be a greeter. Somebody else will do this or that. And what happens is, is we have gaps. We're, we're in, the, in the stands and we're getting cardio problems and, and the people out there are getting exhausted because everybody's not doing a part in the body. We're called to serve within the body. And we're all called. I get excited. We have an intro to Central coming up in a couple of weeks. I get excited about intro because new people come and they join the church. I will always get excited because here these new people are. That means that God may have new things, new ministries for us right here. Because if you're not serving in your place, that means your place is vacant. And so we need you. we got to serve within the church. So we serve at home. We serve within the church. Thirdly, we serve in our rhythm of life. Whatever comes along, we just serve in the rhythm of life. Wherever you are, at your work, at your school, in your neighborhood, you just serve other people. You care for them. This is your DNA. This is your basin and towel. This is what you do. You just serve. It ought to be the, the qualification. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. By the love you have one another, love expressed is serving. And so we serve other people just in our rhythm of life. Like, like uh, when Alan was going over the, the things with the parents, we were talking about the rhythm of your daily life. And that's the way we serve in the rhythm of our daily life. The, the, 
here's a case in point. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the guy that got beat up on the road, and the Good Samaritan stops. Was he planning that? Oh, I'm going to stop and help a guy along the side of the road today. No, it wasn't in his daytime or he just served. And so we're called to serve in our rhythm of life. Fourthly, serve at home, serve, serve in your family, serve in the church, serve in your rhythm of life. Fourth one is this, serve the unlovelies. You see, there are certain people in our world that the world calls throwaways. And if we as the church throw them away, shame on us. We are called to serve. We're called to wash their feet. We're called to care for them. You may remember in the scriptures that, uh, that there are two basins mentioned. One was Pilate. I call this basin theology. You ready? Pilate took a basin when Jesus was in front of him and he washed his hands and he said, I have no responsibility here. His blood is on you. I wash my hands of the whole thing. That was his view of life. And sometimes we do that. Lord, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. I'm not going to have anything to do with this world. I'm just going to wash it off. I'm entitled for myself. I'm going to wash it off. But then Jesus took a basin and a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. His basin theology was, I will stoop as low as it takes to serve you and love you. What kind of basin theology of you? Is it all about you? Or is it about serving others? I'll end with this. Uh, I preface by saying I'm a good husband. <laughs> but uh, about a month and a half ago, I was, uh, I was on... It is scary. Isn't it scary? You think something, and then the next thing you know, it's on your computer. But I was, I was thinking about Valentine's, which was this past... Friday, I hope, we, hope you, I hope you did something, but uh, I, I, I was going to do something, and, and so I, I, um, I, I told Pam, because I, this is what it was, Fredericksburg Hot Air Balloon Festival, I thought, man, and they even had Valentine's in there, I thought, this is, this looks good, I clicked on it, and I showed it to Pam. I said, what do you think? And she said, man, that really looks fun. And so we invited Jim and Pam Moorhead to go with us. We thought, man, this is going to be great. You pay online. And, uh, but it became a comedy of errors all of a sudden because Pam was making motel reservations and she clicked on Fredericksburg all right, but it was Fredericksburg, Virginia. <laughs> and uh, so we had rooms in Fredericksburg, Virginia on, on Friday night. And Pam Moorhead had the same problems with, with getting a room. So by the time we figured this out, it was Thursday, Tuesday. And we're going to be going on Friday. And so we thought, man, we can't get any rooms. Fredericksburg's bipped up, which made us think, man, this is a big deal. And we, so we, we, go, we decide, okay, we'll just make a one-day thing out of it. It was going to be two days, but we think we'll just make a one-day. We'll, we'll leave out of here. We'll go to Fredericksburg, and we'll... We'll enjoy it. We'll walk around Fredericksburg, and then the big hot air balloon festival starts at four, and we'll go, we'll go do that. So, so uh, we've got our tickets and 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 everything, and and so we're driving out. We've walked around and and had lunch and everything. So we drive out to where it's going to be at this cornfield out there, and and uh, um, we go out there, and there was a lot of cars, and you come in, and they're parking, and man, we we had to pay twenty bucks for parking, and so. Man, we're out a room in Virginia, and we're out <laughs> 30 bucks for the tickets, and we're out 20 bucks for parking. But man, we're at the Hot Air Balloon Festival. And, and I got to be honest, we, I had this mindset, Hot Air Balloon Festival, I had this mindset, and the marketing was really good. And, and uh, I was thinking of Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, hundreds of hot air balloons. That's what in my mindset. We learned something. That if it's over five to seven miles an hour of wind, you cannot have a hot air balloon. 
We did not see a hot air balloon. <laughs> and we, 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 we go in there, and they were trying to blow one up, and, but they were warning you, oh, the wind may be too strong. And we went in there, and, and literally, we weren't there 30 minutes, 20 minutes. We think they were, they were supposed to have all these vendors and stuff. They were all food. Well, we just had lunch. And, uh, and, and we had reservations for dinner in Fredericksburg. And we were, we were thinking, man, I'm thinking this marketing guy is out of sight. He is good. We're going to hire him for the church because he market <laughs> this incredible thing. But I got to tell you, there was tremendous unmet expectations. Now, we had a lot of laughter, and we fun, and, and they all fell asleep in the car on the way back, and I drove us back very safely <laughs> to Round Rock. But, but, you know, it hit me when I read the Scriptures, and I look at what it means to be a follower of Jesus and His Spirit living inside of us. I wonder when the world looks at us that they see unmet expectations. Instead of seeing Jesus, they see a small replica of the real thing. Instead of people that are taking the basin and the towel and serving one another. I don't know. My prayer is, is that we start this decade serving in our homes, serving in the church, serving in our rhythm of life serving what the world calls the unlovelies.